what you got to say to all these people that got a nine to five yeah. or going to school and just always say, yeah. I don't have the time to do this. I don't have the I'll, time. Um, I'll say that they, and, and, I, and I say this with respect, but they don't respect what they have, what they're mm -hmm. trying to build as much as they respect their job. Yeah. Here's what I mean by that. Um, you know, when you have a job and you have a nine to five, which is great, by the way, you'll never hear me shit on nine to fives. Mm -hmm. I, I, I value it because mm -hmm. it helped me. But when you have a job, I mean, most of the time you're going to have a supervisor or a manager or somebody that you report to. If your supervisor tells you to do something, you're going to do it. Yeah. You got to be at a meeting. Guess what you're going to do? You're going to be at that meeting. You got to mm -hmm. go handle something with a client. You're going to do it. Why? Because it's your job. Mm -hmm. When we decide that we want to build something for ourselves, we start negotiating with ourselves. If we know that, you know what, I told myself I'm going to do 20 dollars a day, I'm going to do 50 dollars a day, whatever the case may be, and life lifes, because guess what? Life is going to life regardless. Mm -hmm. When life lifes and stuff gets in the way, it's not going to get in the way of your job. It's mm -hmm. not. Even if you got somebody to be picked up, you got to take somebody to the airport, whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. you're still going to get your job done because it's your job. Mm -hmm. You're going to work your job around your life. Mm -hmm. right? But when we decide to build something for ourselves, we work our life around what we're trying to build. Mm -hmm. And so then we start negotiating with ourselves. We know we said we're going to start doing something. Ah, I gotta, I'm going to go do this. I'm, I'm going to put it off until I do this. We start negotiating with ourselves. Listen, if we gave mm -hmm. ourselves and we start building something with the same level of respect the sa and we stop negotiating with our dreams... Mm -hmm. The way we don't negotiate with our day jobs, then we can actually move the needle, right? So you, we have to really attack it and really be That's 100 serious. That's 100% facts, bro. That's 100% facts because it's it even like with somebody that, that'll go to the damn designer store and buy, you know, buy whatever, some kicks or whatever for $1,000. But then when it's time to spend $1,000 on a course or exactly. some internship, you're like, ah. ah. Yo, what's good? What's good with everybody? Oh, man. It's your boy Abram Mitchell, and you are not tuned in to the Triple M show where you unlock the secrets of a money making mindset. You don't know what you might run into on this show, man. <laughs> Me and TJ, bro, we did. <laughs> Well, we got a formal introduction from my dog, man. Look, y'all know the motto, though. Look, like, subscribe, share, comment, share this with a friend. Tell them, share with 10 friends. We got to get this information out here, man. We getting, what, what are you coming to the Triple M show to learn? One, you learning about a money-making mindset where the mindset make the money. I believe that you can't do anything if you don't think about it the right way. What I mean by that? Well, if you walk around thinking negative about money, if you think everything is a scam, if you think everybody is fake and nothing is real, then guess what? You probably never go do any of those things to become successful yourself. But if you have the right mindset about certain things, if you know and believe, hey, if this guy is building houses or if this guy is doing Airbnbs, buying hotels, then I could do it too. I just need to acquire the information. Absolutely. And then after I acquire it, I need to take action on it. So every single week, Y'all are coming here to acquire information. We've had bankers on here. We've had real estate developers on here. We've had everything at this point. Uh, I think the only thing we had on here is like a lawyer or something. <laughs> so we're going to have to get that too. We just had a million dollar janitor come on here last week and talk about how he's became a million dollar janitor. So, you know? So uh, at the end of the day, you come here to learn and get this information, but it's what you do with it after this show turns off is what's going to make you successful. So today, man, I have the pleasure of interviewing my brother, Mr. TJ, man. How you doing? Man, I'm feeling great, brother. Feeling great. Great to be here, man, back here in Nashville. Yes, you know sir. What I'm saying? I done finally caught you, bro. Yeah. Like, every time I'm catching you when you already to love Yeah, I'd already. <laughs> yeah. Is this like your third year coming to this? Country, yeah, 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 yeah. It's my third my third year in a row coming to Nashville for the same yeah. conference, yeah. Yeah. Sure. So that's fire, bro, man. I'm actually excited for this interview myself. We was getting to talking. We were yeah, like, oh, yeah, we yeah. say this one yeah. for the show. So, yeah. uh, Man, TJ, you uh, you from Houston? You living in Houston? Living in right? Houston. Are you from Houston? Originally, no, but I, I'm, I'm from Houston. Well, you, you can say I'm from Houston. Tell uh, people who TJ is. Man, so uh, originally from Nigeria, uh, born there, um, was there till I was eight years old, and we moved down to Houston. Okay. And we only chose Houston. My family chose Houston because we already had family there. And if you know anything about Houston, okay, you know that there's it's a pretty decent Nigerian community mm -hmm. in Houston. So my mom has siblings there already, so that's why we chose Houston in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but I've been in Houston ever since. End up going to the University of Houston, and that was by choice because I wanted to stay close to home, so okay. stay close to my mom. And um, and so I ended up graduating from the University of Houston. It took me six years, but I. Mm -hmm. But I wrapped that up and got an engineering degree. Uh, right. But but the thing is, is that living I living the American dream. Uh, living the American dream, man. <laughs> and you know it's crazy because the thing is, when you when you understand 
when it comes to Nigerian community and the Nigerian household, I know at least back then, how you determine success is based on your level of education. That's how we determine success in in our, in our household. That's why I know it well, bro, because my best friend, I mean, my bad to cut you out. No, no, you good. My best friend is Nigerian. Yeah. Like, coming up, like, yeah. second grade. So it's like, when I say best friend, like, families yeah. know each other. Like, I didn't spend time with him and his family, vice versa, you know what I'm saying? So, like, I didn't got to, you know, see the Nigerian culture, you know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Like, I'd have been at the parties, dancing, throwing the money, you know what I'm saying? You probably got a couple outfits or something. Yeah, I ain't got no outfits. Oh, he ain't lace you up? He ain't lace me up, I might, bro. Have, to, I, I I might have to lace bro, you up. Bro, you watching this show, bro. He, he said it. He said it because he know how many times I'd have been in Brazil. Yeah, I get laced up, man, yeah. But, like, I didn't seen, like, you know, how serious, you know, the Nigerian yeah, household bro. take education because yeah. I can only imagine, like, you put in, you said you was born in Nigeria. Born in bro. Nigeria. Yeah, okay, yeah. so eight years old, you was kind of at the point where you could see what's going on. Oh, yeah. How hard it I remember. Really is. Oh, yeah. To get from Nigeria to America. Can you just at least like just touch on that a little bit? Oh my bit? God. First of all, that transition was was very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um the, the biggest issue we had was yeah. the kids in school, right? Yeah. Growing up. I was actually supposed to start school in the third grade, but I ended up starting me in the second grade because of the my birthday was in October. Okay. And so my birthday's in October. So they said, Oh, based on your birthday, you gotta start a second grade. So you wanted those cool, but they like my birthday <laughs> late. <you know? laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and there, I never heard that narrative until I got here. They said, Oh, this is where my birthday late. I was like, yeah. oh, so they'll be back. All right, whatever. Mm-hmm case may be, but um, started school in the second grade. Our biggest issue was, man, the kids, school stopped bullying us, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I had never, because it's so, because imagine coming from a place to where everybody looked like you. Mm-hmm. Um, even y'all, it, all y'all here nappy just look the same. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Look the same. Like, look the same. The same. See what I'm saying? We wore, even when we went to school, we used to walk to school back home in Nigeria, and okay. we wore a, a uniform, like button down, short sleeve, like pattern, got to be tucked in, belt, they got a mm-hmm. seat belt, shorts, like, we and we walked to school, and so... We all like talking about the same. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there you come. We come here, very diverse. And if you know anything about Houston, very diverse city. Mm-hmm. A lot of different people, which 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 was fine. That was that wasn't a shock at all. And just when we got there, we just thought that you know people would be nice, like we saw on TV, mm-hmm. and it was the complete opposite. Yeah. <laughs> and these kids were ruthless. Yeah. That's, <laughs> bro, I ain't gonna lie, bro. And I seen I seen somebody. I think it was a. Uh, the Maddie J dude. Yeah. He made Maddie. most about it. Yeah. He was like, bro, <laughs> Maddie they did. used to flame Nigerians. Like, bro, back in school, Nigerians, Africans got what? clown, but I feel like now. Are like, we up now? Five- <laughs> what you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Are we up now? Bro, Nigerians is, uh, is we popping. Like y'all we're is popping right we're now. We popping. And and, and 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 really a lot of a lot of different I'm saying y'all, but shit, man. <laughs> I, I did my ancestry, man. I'm shit, I forgot what it was. What, <laughs> what tribe out? Damn, I'm I'm remembering this. Yeah, yeah. I had to get I had to get my boy a, a Nigerian name because he did his. He found out he was about 35% Nigerian. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> see, I was like. Man, I forget. I, I I gotta find it out, bro. Cause yeah. I did it and everything, and like they gave me my tribe. Yeah. Like gave me the percentages and everything. That's like, what's up. It wasn't Nigeria. It was a little, mm. a little up, but I don't know. I can't remember it right now. Yeah, well, sure, definitely, definitely look into that for sure. We, I mean, shoot, we, growing up, that that was challenging. Mm-hmm. Of course, my mom didn't have money to send us to college. Yeah. Single mom, five kids, and I had to literally watch my mom. I'm talking about like we when we, when we were growing up. My mom had to work all the time. Mm-hmm. So uh, I was eight. My brother was nine. My other brother was 11. Okay. And she would leave us at the crib. Cause, and, you know, lock the door. Don't answer the door for nobody. Mm-hmm. Hey, I call. She calls at specific time. She call like every two hours just to check on us. Mm-hmm. Every single day. And she would call to check on us. When we wake up for school, because she worked overnight too. We woke up for school at 5 a.m. We got to call them up. We got to call her. Let her know we up. Let her know. Uh, and by the time, and that time it's not called. We got to page. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we yeah. page her. And then she yeah. calls the house. But she can call the house whenever we want to reach her. We page, and then she calls, mm-hmm. and so then we had to, do, and that was that that was what it was. You know what I'm saying? And so um, we didn't ha- we didn't have much, and we ended up I ended up putting myself through school because, and that that alone was was a whole, was a whole situation because you can imagine coming from Nigeria, we didn't um, didn't have papers necessarily. Mm-hmm. We were allowed to go to school because, and which was great, we were allowed to go to a Texas school, um, but we didn't necessarily have papers. So even going to college, no scholarships, even though I tried. I was actually awarded the Dell Scholarship out of high school. The okay. Dell Scholarship is twenty k to go to college, plus Ooh. a free Dell laptop. Oh, that was that a they, blessing that they took away. 
because they took the, they the took, a, they took they took the whole thing they, away. Oh, I, I'm about to say they I took mean, the whole thing they, away. They took, the <laughs> they took the twenty. They took everything because they said, "Oh, we did a background check. You're not a citizen. You got to be a citizen to get the scholarship." And so, so uh, you had been going to school, living yeah, in America yeah. from eight years old yeah. up until you probably 18, 19 at this time. I, I uh, yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, I was about 16, 17 at this time. Okay. And so then that that ne didn't necessarily ha happen. But and my mom was like, "Well, what are we gonna do? We can't get sent yeah. to school." I said, "Mom, figure figure it out." So I end up uh, still signing up for orientation. My mom, you know, she, it's it's hard not to talk at my accent when I talk about my mom. <laughs> but, yeah. but but when she 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 was, she was like. Ah, what are you doing? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I was like, Bob, it's cool. I'm, I'm, I'm figuring it out. I'm yeah. trying to go to school and all that. Bro, I ended up going to every, every store, every McDonald's, every department store, every JCPenney. My story was, look, I'm not supposed to talk to people about my situation, but man, I need a job. If you give me some work, you know what I'm saying? I will, um, I'll be the best worker you ever had, right? I just need, I just need an opportunity. Everybody, man, I would love to hire you, but we can't. We need a social security card, right? Which yeah. I didn't have at the time. <laughs> we need, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And so, and so, you uh, to go get in the real estate yeah, world. <laughs> They'll pay you right <laughs> away, right? Away, right? Yeah, no, what? Imagine if I if if I knew that at that time, it's, and I it, because I still my mission was to get into college. Yeah. That was the mission. I wanted to make my mom proud, and wasn't mm -hmm. nobody stopped me from that. And so I ended up getting a shot at a foot action store. This is a Hispanic guy named Aaron's. Like, bro, I, I'll give you a shot. I mean, mm -hmm. I can't put you on salary like everybody else with commission. Everybody gets salary and commission. I can only give you commissions. If you're mm -hmm. cool with that, then we can run. I said, bro, that's all I need. Mm -hmm. Bro, I became the best worker he ever had. Mm -hmm. I started making money multiple ways at that store. Mm -hmm. um, the, when when the, um, I tell you the said story, at a foot action at a foot action store. Okay, at, at a foot action store. Um, when the, when the, when the retro Jordans come out. Yeah, yeah. At that time, people would line up on the side of the building to get Jordans. So we had. I would hold. Um, our manager would be in on it. He would have eight. The top salesperson would get five. Everybody else get three. I'm always the top. So I got five people that I could hold their shoes mm -hmm. where they ain't got to stand in line, and I can charge a fee for it. It's how much I charge to hold a shoe. Just to hold it. This is not go towards the cost of the shoe, $500. To hold the shoe. So you getting the edge to five. I'm getting the 500 Every time a new pair. 16, bro, every time a new pair of retros came out, I made 2500 Every yeah. time a new pair. And then it was a waiting list. Mm -hmm. I had my five people, and if somebody dropped off, I had somebody ready to fill the spot in. How did, how like, that's good, because how did that, like, shift your mindset? I feel like coming up, before I even get into that, like, you already started learning, like, discipline. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And hustle. Like your mom yep. leaving you home and then you knowing every two hours they go call 5 a.m. in the morning, boom. We, You know what I'm saying? So yep. that's teaching you like discipline. And then now, okay, I get to, to the point where I won't go to college and I get a scholarship. You probably had to what, do like some essays or something? Yeah, like yeah. Oh, I had to do it. Bro, I'll, I'll be up like not even sleeping in high school filling out scholarship applications. Boom, so you put in all that work and we, what that kind of remind me of is a, a deal getting to the closing. Get to the closing. You, know so you put in all that work, then boom, no scholarship. No scholarship. So yeah. then now you still like, I'm not taking no for an yeah. answer. You go to all these places to get a job. Because mm -hmm. with me, I put in a bunch of applications, McDonald's too, and they ain't hit me back. You know <laughs> and then you finally find a job and you start making money. Yeah. So like what? What's going through your mind at that point? You still even wanting to go to college, or you like trying to find out about entrepreneurship at that? point? You know what's crazy? You you would think that I'm now my entrepreneurship mind is kind of opening up, yeah. which I think it is, but it was a dormant open because mm -hmm. I was still had a goal to be an engineer. Yeah, gotta get my engineering degree. Gotta get my gotta make my family proud. Gotta get yeah. my engineering degree, and so that was more sort of mentality, mm -hmm. bro. Whenever when I was working at that store, whenever a pair a new pair of Jordan or Nike shorts new line roll out. They had to discount at a deep discount the ones that are currently there to make room for the new line. When those when those shorts get discounted about sixty to seventy five percent, I would add my thirty five percent employee discount. I'm buying these shorts for about five to ten bucks, um, and they retail for like sixty, right? So I would buy these shorts for about five bucks. I'll clean up the entire store. I take them to the dorm rooms on campus and I'll sell them for forty, forty five, thirty five. And that's paying straight for your that's straight, everything. And that's and that's college. And, and that's and that was helped me. This is literally how I put myself through college. Mm -hmm. So so what's crazy is that it didn't even occur to me until I got into real estate that I was wholesaling those apparels and they even realized that. Bro, you was wholesaling <laughs> the, 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 the whole Nike. I was I was arbitraging the Nike. Bro, the, the Nikes. 
Bro, so so you I was had this them under contract. You <laughs> 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 had to use none of your own money. You had to put no money. <laughs> Nobody. You know leverage, saying? leverage. Yeah, bro, bro, it's, it's it's a lot of money to be made as a middleman. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. that's that was that was one of the things people I learned. People try to shit on the middleman. Oh nah, bro, ever, never. You need the middleman. You need the middleman. <laughs> <laughs> the middleman bring resources. <laughs> Fucking peanut butter and jelly. Heck yeah, uh, the Dallas heck, heck yeah, you know heck yeah. Heck you. I'm I'm here at your office right now. I, I, you introduced me to your team. Your mm-hmm. your marketing manager is literally, in a way, she's a middleman feeding your team leads, yes. right? And so she's literally in between the transactions. So yes. there's a lot of opportunities as a middle person for sure. Yep, yep, yep. So this is what I want to ask you because I hear you saying you kind of was thinking about it, you know, when you was at Foot Action, like kind of thinking about entrepreneurship and how you can make a lot of money of, you know, being a middleman, hustling, you know what I'm saying, getting the opportunity. But you still was like, I got to go to college. got to get this. Yeah. Degree. But what I'm hearing you saying is for my family, for my family. Mm-hmm. So do you think you was doing it for yourself or you was just so focused on making your family proud that you was kind of really like not even really paying attention to anything else? It was just like, I need to get this degree. The latter. That's what my parents did. A thousand percent the latter. Okay. Now, now what's crazy is that, you know, you, you hear the notion about um, cultured parents, Nigerian parents especially, mm-hmm. doctor, attorney, yeah. <laughs> right, engineers, what they want you to be. I was never pushed to be an engineer. Okay. I chose to be an engineer. Okay. I actually went into University of Houston to be an architect. Okay. I did a semester of architecture school and realized that it's not enough math for me. Mm-hmm. I'm very math heavy. All you need, for, I thought a lot of math was needed for Ooh, architecture. First person I was <laughs> it's, true, it's not enough. Yeah, it's not math. enough math. I was like, because right. I, I felt like I wasn't good at most other subjects except for math. Except for math. <laughs> so, so, numbers. Numbers. Yep. So I was like, there's not enough. They said, all you need is pre-calculus. I said, I already took pre-calculus. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so, I already, yeah. so then, then I moved to being an engineer and that's very math intensive. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I got a whole math minor behind that. So, but I think the latter because I was so focused still. I wanted to be an engineer Mm -hmm. because I learned that they made a lot of money. Mm -hmm. My, one of my mentors, I was, I was, I was teaching uh, mathematics. I was, that was another, another gig I had on campus. I was a math tutor. I was a math tutor. I was teaching the mathematics and the guy, one of the tutors walked in and he, we were chopping it up. And then he said, um, he said, bro, like, you, you remind me of myself. Like, he's, he was a muscular guy as well. He said, bro, you remind me of myself. He was, and I was like, well, what do you do? He said, I'm, I'm, I'm a senior about to graduate my engineering degree. I just signed my full-time offer with Chevron. I'm making 86000 coming out of college. That's At what he that told point, me. You like- I didn't even know what an engineer did, Abram. I didn't even know what an engineer did. I said, I want to do that right there. Can I do that? Yeah. I want to do just that. And then he said, yeah, dude, you know, you got to apply this and this and that. And so I, I went back and I told, I came back the next day. I said, I'm going to do civil engineering. He said, ah, I don't know about civil, man. Civil's cool, but you, you, I want you to do mechanical. You'll be a lot more diverse from mechanical. Mm-hmm. I was like, why? He said, because you can do, you can put your hands on different, different type of things with mechanical. It's a little bit of everybody, but it's harder. Mm-hmm. I was like, all right, best. That's literally how I became an engineer. Yeah. From that conversation. Mm-hmm. Dead serious. And that's and, normally <laughs> how it be. And that, <laughs> from when I was in college, I was like, which degree, which um, major in business it paid the most money? <laughs> <laughs> Searching it. Oh, economics, all right, cool. Man. Let's do that. <laughs> I, want, I, did, I was like, I'm, people, like, I'm talking to people. I remember having a conversation with one of my professors, and they was like, well, what do you want to do? And mm-hmm. I was like, and it's crazy because one of my professors, I said, I want to own a business. Mm. And he was like, well, you know you don't have to have a business, business degree, degree to own a business. <laughs> I said, for real? <laughs> So then at that point, I'm thinking my exit from college, because I dropped out. I ain't even finished. Wow. And that's probably how I came across yeah. wholesaling, because I'm just thinking, I'm like, he said, I don't even need to, wow. to own the business. Yeah, you, know? you don't. And then I hear one of my other professors say, oh, uh, uh, a bachelor's degree is the same as a high school uh, diploma <laughs> at this point now. And now masters are becoming less and less mm-hmm. like yeah. uh, valuable for jobs, you know, because jobs value experience. But- all right, cool. You talk to, and, and it's crazy because we got similar. Like your parents, like your mom, they got you to the to America, but they couldn't really probably like give you the game on no where where to go in college. You know what I'm saying? That's the same thing with me. So boom, you got the you 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 became a mechanical engineer. What was the goal with that? Like, did you even know what field you wanted to be in? Uh, well, I don't know nothing about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, all, bro. bro, I had no clue what field I wanted to be in, but I knew that oil and gas made a lot of money. Okay. So when I saw that he was getting an offer from Chevron, I was like, I want to be in oil and gas. I mean, that yeah. was it. I wanted to be in oil and gas. And so that's exactly what I did. I got into oil and gas coming out of college. And, uh, but what's crazy, 
um, coming out of college, I got into oil and gas. And I was actually, I started making six figures coming out of college. Most money, most money in my family. So uh, you got, you got the degree. Got the degree. What is it, a bachelor's it was, or it was a, No, I got a bachelor's degree. It took me six years to get my bachelor's. And what even turned my mind to being an entrepreneur. You were a little older than me, so the <laughs> I mean, They was a little more valuable little, when you was, I, they, like right now the bachelor's that, actually were nothing. You, you know what? It's crazy how it's crazy how that's happening. Yeah. Um it wasn't until one of my boys that I went to college with, he was like, bro, I just read this book. I watched you hustle your way through college. You need to read this book. Just that book. That that. Right. Absolutely. I was working offshore at the time, and I took that book with me offshore. I read it three times while I was there offshore, and that was yeah. I couldn't. I like get me off this rig. I need to go buy some assets like right now. And okay, so, so that's what real estate. That's what real estate. That's what the next question. And, I and it wasn't. It wasn't until then. Then I started realizing, bro, I've been doing entrepreneurship shit <laughs> my whole <laughs> life, this whole time. <laughs> like, so that's when it clicked for me. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so then I was like, all right, I'm built for this. Yeah, we can run this. So you know boom, you had <laughs> you. Yeah, that's crazy. I, I'm from Louisiana, bro, so I know the plant. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I got my twit in. Oh, Why you got a twit? You had to get you got a twit. I oh, did wow. that, and they never got a job. That's never. crazy. I got my twit license. Yeah. Went, took that damn eight-hour class. That. Yeah, got to all that. Went, drove to all the plants because I'm just broke college student trying to get some money. Yeah. I, there was like so many people on the waiting list. They, wow. They were trying to get me scaffolding. I'm like, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I nah. got to climb down. <laughs> so, boom, you got six-figure job straight out of college. Now Came at a cost. Re, it, it, yeah. That six-figure job came at a cost because I was only able to make six figures out of college because I was working. I decided to go out in the field and work offshore. Mm -hmm. Straight out of college, I was out working offshore. So you ain't got no time. I had no. So I was, I was making six figures, but I was gone about sixty five percent of the year. I wasn't mm -hmm. even. In, I was even on Earth. I wasn't even on land. Not on Earth. On land. <laughs> so you just on the boat. On a boat. So Where most of my years on a boat. Yeah. So now at this point, you like, you got the money, but then you like, damn, my time is gone. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't even feeling like you was really making six figures because it was like. You couldn't do nothing. Like you, you honestly, honestly, I didn't mind it. Okay, to be real. I didn't okay. mind it because my mentality going into it, I knew it wasn't going to be a long term thing. Okay, like, listen, no family, no kids, no obligations right now. I might as well go out and make the most amount of money I could. That yeah. was the mindset going into it because they gave me an option. They said you can take the office job at 70, 72K or do the field job and you'll make about 105 to 110. No, give me your money. I said, yeah, listen, I'll take, I'll take the field job. And, yeah. and, and the experience I will get will be way better than the experience in the office as well. And so um, that's why I decided to go that, go that route. And I didn't, I didn't hate it, honestly. Uh, um, I didn't like the fact that it kept me gone so much. I almost missed my best friend's wedding behind that job. Mm -hmm. Like, so um, it's, it's the time, cons the time constraint that it required was, was pretty big. Um, but it was a short time for, for, for a lifetime for me. It was a short yep. time for, for a lifetime. So I wouldn't even... It was, was it was the goal always initially to move up, like within the company. Yeah, yeah. The goal was an issue, bro. You couldn't tell me I wasn't gonna be a director, a chairman of some running some type, mm -hmm. some department high up, like mm -hmm. at some point in time in my engineering career. What career. year is this? I read that book two thousand. I read Rich that poor dad twenty fourteen. Okay, cool. So twenty fourteen, you got that's the same year you got the job. I got, I started my I started my job twenty twelve. 2012. Mm -hmm. All right. So two years into the job, mm -hmm. you get that book, Rich mm -hmm. Dad, Poor Dad. Yep. You read this book, Instant Mindset Shift. That's me too. That's the first, like, it's not the first book I read, but I tell people that's the first book I read. <laughs> the first meaningful book but I got read. You. you know what got I'm you. saying? Yeah. So boom, you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and you like, okay, I've already been doing entrepreneurship. That's what got me where I'm at today. And, you know, I, I'm ready to go all in with this. So what's the first move you made, like, in the real estate game? Um, first thing I did was bought the house that I grew up in. Okay. I bought the house that I grew up in for my mom. You bought first it thing, from your mom? Bought it from my mom. First, Man, first, first thing I did. Second thing I did was bought my first investment property. Now, this first, my first investment property I bought with my money. So did you buy, back before that, before that, you bought the house that your mom, that you grew up in. Did you like put your mom in it? Like you no, bought my mom, it? My mom had already, uh, my mom had already moved out because she had got remarried. Okay. And so my mom had got married, and then she moved to to the suburbs. Okay. So this, is, this is and that happened when I was in 
like in college, like my junior year, senior year. So she and she moved out into the burbs, and, and so that house kind of sat vacant for a little bit. And so then I, once I graduated, I was I just moved into it when I graduated because I told my mom I was like I'm just moving there when I graduate. Mm-hmm. So I moved into it when I graduated. And you then, weren't paying no rent or nothing. You just, I was. I was paying a mortgage. Oh, I right. the way you said mortgage. it, I'm like Arr, I was paying a mortgage. Okay. Um, and then uh, and then I just like you know, I'll just buy it. Okay. <laughs> so Boom. I just bought it. I just bought it. But I had already moved into it by the time I bought it. Okay. And so, but it didn't feel like I I didn't feel like I turned to an investor after that deal though honestly because yeah. I lived there mm-hmm. I didn't feel like I was like is this investor but my second property I was like all right now I'm getting to investment properties I started out my first my first property I wanted I wanted to get into long-term buy and hold mm-hmm. I started doing I bought a I bought two long-term buy and holds before I started wholesaling okay which is which I know is a little backwards yeah for a lot of people but and, but when see, you read that book though he does and that's, talk it, about, it, that's what yeah. made because that's the book it mm-hmm. made me want to just own assets I'm like, yeah. I need to buy some houses and that's literally why I got into long-term buy hold mm-hmm. before wholesaling and so I um that that particular deal I did that very first property I bought was a single family house three bedroom two bath mm-hmm. ready to go didn't need any work matter of fact the owner had just replaced the roof replaced the AC replaced the floor did all the work that's needed ready to go. And I bought that property with my money. See, there's to me, when I learned about long-term buying home, when you buy real estate, there's a time versus money trade-off. Mm-hmm. And so I bought it with my money because it was only 92000 And I bought twenty, I bought a 20% down. Mm-hmm. Bought about, with closing costs, about $22,000, $23,000 mm-hmm. to the closing table. Bought the property. I listed it for rent. By the time I listed it for rent, within two weeks, I had over 20 applications. Had it rented out within two weeks of owning the property. My mortgage was about eight forty. I'll rent it out for about twelve fifty. That delta, that's my cash flow. This is in twenty. This is this is two. Now that now I bought that. This is uh uh. I put it on a contract December twenty fourteen. I closed on January twenty fifteen. Okay, boom. That that was my first one. How old are you at this point? At that point, I was twenty six. Okay, twenty six years. Twenty six at that point. So then um then the next property I bought. This property is distressed. Mm-hmm. Now this one, because I then I learned about hard money lenders. So I'm, you know, I'm I'm immersing myself in the mm-hmm. game. Now I'm learning about hard money. Yeah. So I learned about hard money lenders. So I said, all right, bet I'm gonna find a, a distress deal, find a distress deal, leverage a hard money lender to 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 fund it. Um, I only came out of my pocket about thirty five hundred dollars mm-hmm. versus the <laughs> versus 20, the twenty two. So bought the property, fixed it up, started mm-hmm. renting it out. Now it took me about a month to fix it up. Mm-hmm. Then it took about another month to refinance it. From the point of of purchase to cash flow, right? It's a much longer time period than than a property that's ready to go. Mm-hmm. But see, I'm okay because I bought that property with my time more so, not my money. Mm-hmm. That first deal I bought with my money, 20% down. The second one I bought with my time. You got more a better so. deal. I had a better equity, And I was, I was willing to fix it up. I had to leverage a private lender, hard money lender, fix it up, did all that, refinanced it. Then I was able to rent it out. Mm-hmm. But- I was willing to go through that time, but it was little to no money out of my pocket mm-hmm. versus cash flowing right away, property's ready to go, but that costs more money than anything. So there's this kind of time versus money trade off when it comes Which to one's cash special. flow better. Um, they both cash flow about the same, uh, okay. but, but this one is a better return. Yeah. Why? Because it's less money out of my pocket. Yeah. And this one, this one is more equity in it. It's more, and, it's, and it's more equity. This mm-hmm. one, I captured 30% equity instantly. This one, mm-hmm. I have 20% equity that I put down on. Mm hmm. This so it came out, out. It came out your exactly. pocket. This, this equity came in my, my pocket. Mm-hmm. This equity was captured. Mm-hmm. So boom, you two totally deals di- in. Two totally different. So I'm two deals in. Yeah. Then I two deals wholesale. in in 2015. One deal you done spent twenty three thousand. So because normally your people that's watching this, they they hear like the normal American dream story. Save up the twenty percent. Yep. Put down. Do the burst strategy, mm-hmm. and then you making like three hundred dollars mm-hmm. a month. Then keep doing that until mm-hmm. you know you you're, you're wealthy or you mm-hmm. find yourself in your job. But it's like, man, bro, I'm not about to d- put it all this work to save twenty three thousand dollars and trade it for a couple hundred dollars a month. Right. If I haven't figured out how to make a high income yep. already, you know yep. what I'm saying. So this kind of where I feel like you're going already because yeah. you said you did two deals. Yep. Then you went to wholesaling. Yep. What made you go into wholesaling? <laughs> was it because the cash flow? Wasn't I went. I no. Well, I went to an event. I went to okay. a networking event, and there was a bunch of wholesalers there. Okay, and they were 
throw, throwing out the numbers and the deals. Are we wholesale deal? I'm like, okay, wholesaling, okay. Because yeah. I knew about wholesaling. I, yeah. just, I was like, you know what? I'm going to just play in this ride. Yeah. Like, you know what? Let me try this wholesaler thing. So mm-hmm. I, I went out to look for a wholesaling mentor. Mm-hmm. And that's when I came across a Clever Investor. Okay, Cody. <laughs> I came across Cody. Yeah. And this is, and so I. This is in 2015. This still. is 2015. All right. It's 2015 still. Started, and so I bought his course, um, learned about wholesaling. But by the time I bought his course, I did my Damn, first wholesale deal Cody within two weeks. Cody was in the game now. He been, Bro, Cody, Cody was in the game long, like a minute. He's been, and he was already pretty established even at that point. Even <laughs> right. in 2015. 2015, he was doing his thing already. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So what's crazy is that, that um, I, but by the time I bought the course, it was two weeks later, I closed my first wholesale deal. I closed my first wholesale deal within two weeks. Um, I made $7,500 on that deal. Mm. And in two weeks. In two weeks. How and many so hours me, you think you spent on that? Oh, shoot. Probably, I don't know, not much. Maybe, oh, maybe a few hours on that deal. So now you already Bro, this is like that to this is like my my fifth call. It was like, all right, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to sell. Like, yeah. it was, it didn't take much time at all. I was like, oh, shit, man, it's easy. Yeah. Back wholesaling, in 2015, back wholesaling to, was a little easy. Well, here's the thing. Check this out. Check, I was, I, I was, I was big chested. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, man, I've, I have arrived. Yeah. I'm about to quit the job. I'm a wholesaler now. Yeah. I'm about to just wholesale because mm-hmm. I thought it was cake. Mm-hmm. Ask me how long. See, I said two weeks. Yeah. That first, ask me how long it took me to close my second wholesale deal. What about like another nine? Ten months, <laughs> six months, six months, six months. Yeah. What's crazy is I took that money, the seventy five hundred dollars I made, poured it back into business, poured it into marketing. Yeah. Just did the same thing, sent the same postcards out, did the same thing to get the first deal, no deal. Another campaign, nothing. Another campaign, nothing. All the money gone at this point. <laughs> now I'm playing with. I'm. I don't have house money now. I'm playing with my earned money. Mm-hmm. Marketing, no deal, no deal. And so then, did you quit the job or you was just no, 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 no. I was okay. just, all right. <laughs> I you quit still the, had job. the job. I, think I still had the job. And so it it, it took me six I'm months. This highlight right now, bro. You was working on a on a on a ship. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like you barely had time. You know, it's like what you got to say to all these people that got a nine to five yeah. or. Going to school and just always say, yeah. I don't have the time to do this. I don't have the I'll, time. Um, I'll say that they, and, and, I, and I say this with respect, but they don't respect what they have, what they're mm-hmm. trying to build as much as they respect their job. Yeah. Here's what I mean by that. Um, you know, when you have a job and you have a nine to five, which is great, by the way, you'll never hear me shit on nine to fives. Mm-hmm. I, I, I value it because mm-hmm. it helped me. But when you have a job, I mean, most of the time you're going to have a supervisor or a manager or somebody that you report to. If your supervisor tells you to do something, you're going to do it. Yeah. If you got to be at a meeting, guess what you're going to do? You're going to be at that meeting. You got to mm-hmm. go handle something with a client. You're going to do it. Why? Because it's your job. Mm-hmm. When we decide that we want to build something for ourselves, we start negotiating with ourselves. If we know that, you know what? I told myself I'm going to do 20 dollars today. I'm going to do 50 dollars today, whatever the case may be. And life lifes, because guess what? Life is going to life regardless. Mm-hmm. But when life lifes and stuff gets in the way, it's not going to get in the way of your job. It's mm-hmm. not. Even if you got somebody to be picked up, you got to take somebody to the airport, whatever the case may be, mm-hmm. you're still going to get your job done because it's your job. Mm-hmm. You're going to work your job around your life. Mm-hmm. Right? But when we decide to build something for ourselves, we work our life around what we're trying to build. Mm-hmm. And so then we start negotiating with ourselves. We know we said we're going to start doing something. Ah, all right, I gotta, I'm going to go do this. I'm, I'm going to put it off until I do this. We start negotiating with ourselves. Listen, if we gave mm-hmm. ourselves and we start building something with the same level of respect the sa- and we stop negotiating with our dreams mm-hmm. the way we don't negotiate with our day jobs, then we can actually move the needle, right? So you, we have to really attack it and really be That's 100% serious facts, bro. That's 100% Absolutely. facts because it is even like with somebody that, that'll go to the down designer store and buy, you know, buy whatever, some kicks or whatever for $1,000. But then when it's time to spend $1,000 on a course exactly. or some mentorship, you're like, Ah, ah, I ain't got it. It's always a reason why. I ain't got it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and it's probably because somewhere in your mind, you don't, in the mindset, make the money, bro. In your mind, you don't really believe that you deserve yeah. that yeah. level of success, that yeah. you, you've you seen somebody else. Because at this point, it's like no excuse. I'm not going to say not no excuse, but like everybody got Instagram, everybody got phone. So it's like you are being exposed to some level of success, mm-hmm. whether you think it is or not, just by getting on your phone and scrolling, like you could see, you know, if you following the right people. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? No, you absolutely. You see people doing things that, all right, get on YouTube, start searching it up, find reputable people. Like you said, you invested into yourself in 2015 with Cody's mentorship, and then boom, you got a deal in two weeks. 
It took six months to get the other deal, but you learned a skill mm -hmm. that now that can't be taken away mm -hmm. from you. Mm -hmm. And as you put in more reps mm -hmm. in reality, because I tell people, your first 10 deals going to be luck. Mm -hmm. You ain't going to really know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like wholesaling ain't real estate. It's a sales and marketing mm -hmm. game. It's a numbers game. And just like it could take you a thousand no's to get to your first yes, you could get that first yes within five. Within you know what five. I'm saying? Absolutely. And then that next one might not come for another thousand. But in reality, those reps, you're learning how to value deals. You're learning how to talk to sellers on the phone. You're, uh, you're learning uh, the importance of problem solving, the importance of building rapport. Facts. And those are the skills that's going to make you better at, okay, that's a deal, that's a deal, that's a deal. Because half the battle with new wholesalers is they just don't know what a deal look like in their market. Man. I could look at 100 properties and somebody that ain't, that's just getting started could look at the same 100 properties and I'm probably going to spot more opportunity. Yep. Not because I'm just better than you and was blessed with something you didn't have. I put in more reps to you. Put in more reps, absolutely. You know what I'm saying? I put in more rep, reps that, that are, I don't, I, don't, I don't know exactly the word. I forget um, exactly how I word it. But like you could be doing something for a long time yeah. and not getting the experience yeah, exactly. because you're not putting in meaningful reps. The ones reps. that count. The meaningful yeah. reps that count. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. The actual so, action, the income making reps. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So then, boom, you two deals in your first year. Basically, no, you four deals in your first year in real estate. Yeah, yeah, my first, yeah, yeah, bro, my first, yeah, four deals in my first year in real estate, yeah. Okay, how the second year With a full-time job. With a full-time job. With a full-time job. job, all right. <laughs> so we started, and, and so then I started learning, then I, uh, you know who I started learning from? Ron LeGrand. Who? Ron LeGrand. Y'all familiar with Ron LeGrand? No. No, no, Ron LeGrand. <laughs> he's like one of the, he's one of the, he's one of the guys that do creative financing heavy, but he's been in the game, bro. Ron LeGrand's been in the game for so long, a uh, okay. long, long time. Uh, so you started learning from him. I started learning from him about how to do creative financing. Okay. I didn't even know what it was. I mm -hmm. just, I just came across somebody mentioned him at an event and thought about talked about creative finance. I was like, what a creative finance? What is that? Lease mm -hmm. options? The heck is owner finance? Well, damn, okay. Mm -hmm. So then I started looking into creative financing. Mm -hmm. and I started incorporating creative financing into my wholesaling operation, mm -hmm. and which is why. My favorite acquisition strategy right now is to buy deals creatively. I mm -hmm. always shoot to buy deals creatively first before I use traditional funding mm -hmm. because banks are the real winners with real estate deals, bro. Like it's no, it's kind of it's kind, real it's kind of crazy. Every deal. <laughs> bro, the it's lenders kind of always lenders win, are the winners, bro. So yeah. I try to do deals outside of lenders. Mm -hmm. I try, and then if there's already a lender in place, I just keep them in place and mm -hmm. not go get a more expensive lender to take mm -hmm. over to buy. So so I I started incorporating uh, creative financing deals in my wholesaling business. So I started wholesaling lease option deals. Which is That's what we talk about. It's one, one, that. one of my favorite strategies, bro. Mm -hmm. I was wholesaling lease op lease option deals. I would I would put I would find sellers that had properties on the market that had a hard time selling it, um, and I will go in and I will make an offer on that property and I'll tell them like, look, I'll buy it from you on a lease purchase. Give me an example. Give me like a example, of like a lease. Usually, option. usually what happens with a lease option, you sign three agreements. You're going to sign an, the agreement that says, "Listen, we're entering into a lease option." That's just the lease option agreement. The two other agreements that are very important is the lease agreement and the option to purchase agreement. Okay. And so, what what it is is the option to purchase, and you can structure lease option deals multiple ways. But usually, in a typical fashion, when you do when you structure the option to purchase, that price that you agree to with the seller, that's the price that you buy it at at the end of the lease term. Okay. At the end of the lease term, if the value of the property went up, you buy it at the price that you agreed with up front. Mm -hmm. And so what we usually do, now we're using lease options to buy Airbnbs. And we would always get a, um, a credit for an option fee that we put down in the form of a down payment. I recommend if you're going to do an, a, a, a lease option deal where you are the tenant buyer, maybe you want to buy it and turn it to an Airbnb, whatever the case may be. If you are going to be the tenant buyer, I recommend that, that you get a portion of your payments that that will give you credit towards the purchase of the property. Okay. So we always get a seller concession, usually anywhere between 3 to 5K. We always get an option fee that we put down. I recommend don't put down no more than 2% down. If you are the tenant buyer, why? No more than 2 because... You don't own the property yet. I don't want you putting down more than 2% on the property you don't have title to. Mm -hmm. So no more than 2% down. You get credit, 10 to 20% of your rent payments gets you gets your credit towards a purchase. And also you put down an option fee and a seller credit. All that goes towards a purchase as well. And so you have an option to execute the purchase at the end of the lease term. 
If you don't, you walk away, you get nothing back. <laughs> so you need to understand, you need to like this deal because there's not a dollar you get back if you don't execute the purchase. And so even if even if you are late on a payment, they can revoke the entire deal and you don't get nothing back either. So it's a good strategy. You just got to know what you're doing getting into it. But I was what I would do, I would find a seller. I would put the property on a contract as a lease option. Mm -hmm. I would go find a tenant buyer. Now, a tenant buyer, these aren't regular tenants. These aren't regular buyers either. They're somewhere in between. <laughs> That's what we're Is it like somebody that don't have the paperwork? Somebody that doesn't necessarily have the paperwork. And a lot of these tenant buyers, guess what? We, these are people that don't have the credit. Maybe they are green card holders. They're not citizen yet. They can't get qualified for a loan. They um, they just got a situation going on to where they just can't get qualified right now. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times they have capital. They just can't get qualified through a bank. Mm -hmm. So so I would go find these tenant buyers mm -hmm. and then I would charge 5% down. It'd be a 5% down. Oh, so you're making three percent. So I keep three. I give the seller two. Okay. This was how I wholesale lease option deals. Mm -hmm. I will find a tenant buyer. I will keep three percent. They'll put five percent down. I keep three. I get. I get the seller two. Now there's something called a sandwich lease option. A sandwich lease option. Same scenario. I find a tenant buyer. I, he puts down the five percent. Mm -hmm. I give. I give them two. I keep three. So let's just assume that the rental amount that we agreed on is fifteen hundred dollars a month. Okay. But I charge him two thousand dollars a month and I stay in between. I'm not sure so you're getting the five hundred. Yeah, I get five hundred cash for a month. So that's a sandwich lease option. So you technically own the who No. Seller still owns it. Title did not transfer. Seller okay. still owns it until tenant buyer executes the purchase. Okay, because my boy just did a deal like this and he went on title. So that's the owner finance deal. Yeah, he did. It's not a lease option. Okay, he paid the seller because the seller was about to lose the house. Mm -hmm. He put down the down payment, mm -hmm. and he keeps saying he he trying to find a lease option buyer. Oh yeah, okay. So he bought it. Oh, this this is what he's doing. He's doing what's called a simple lease option. Okay, where he owns the property. He bought it owner finance and put down a down payment with the seller. Now he owns it. Title transferred. He owns the property. Now he's finding a tenant buyer to lease option it too. Yeah. And that's he what just found doing. somebody that's putting down putting down, down payment. And then they paying the rent they and he paying getting the rent. cash flow. He's getting cash that. flow. That's a simple lease option. So if that dude don't, because he got in there, if he don't pay, because the down payment wasn't enough, but basically he agreed to pay the whole down payment yeah. within six months. Oh, okay. Yeah. Or three months or whatever. Good. And if he don't pay it, boom. Revoked. And you don't get none of your you money. You don't get none of your money back. And guess what your, your, your boy could do? Do it, all, do, it, do it all over again. Take another down payment for somebody else. That's, that's what your boy, that's what Robert, uh, that's what he talked about at Rich Dad Poor Dad. Yeah. So it's he, the lease option it's, agreement. It's, 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 he talked about like only assets, uh, traditional rentals. He talked about that too. And But the thing is, is that those are the three ways to do lease options. And when you are able, what we were doing is we were wholesaling these things. See, you can't do a sandwich lease in Texas though. Mm -hmm. so I, and I'm, I'm in Houston. So I, I never did a sandwich lease deal. Mm -hmm. I only did what we call wholesaling lease option or assignment lease mm -hmm. option. We assign it. Mm -hmm. um, and with deals like that, when you do a sandwich lease, honestly, my recommendation, if for anybody listening to this, my recommendation is to not do a sandwich lease if you want to do lease options to start off. Don't start with doing sandwich leases. Matter of fact, I'd rather you do at least five assignments okay. before you do a, before you do a sandwich. that's you sell it to somebody else? Yeah, five assignments. Will you, will you find a tenant buyer, let the tenant buyer um, take the 3%, give them the 2%, you out of it. You out of it. You out of it, yeah. right? Now they're paying the, the seller directly. Mm -hmm. And so you out of it. That's a wholesale lease option. And I want you to do five of those first before you even get into doing sandwich lease options. Why? Because sandwich lease options, say they stop paying. Guess who got to pay now? You, you do. You on the hook. It's you on the hook now. Yeah, and that's why he was finding a tenant buyer because he owner financed it. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so the way to try to do a sandwich lease option in Texas is if you just owner finance it get the property yourself mm -hmm. and then you and find then you lease out then you do your own tenant buyer which but is considered that's not considered a sandwich but yeah could, oh but yeah sandwich is a, a sandwich is uh, everybody because a sandwich yeah. for it to be a full sandwich lease option that means the seller still owns it <laughs> yeah. title never transfer to anybody yeah i'm leasing it and i'm releasing it mm. it's a sublease yeah, because his seller was in the situation where he was about to lose it. So he bought it. He basically bought he it. He bought the property. Him. 100% he bought it. It's not even basic. He bought it. With a, he put down a down payment. He bought it. He owns it now. And then he found a tenant buyer. Oh, because he took. 
I got to go see what he did. Because <laughs> I don't know creative finance, but yeah. I've done creative finance deals with my new construction. Mm. So, like, I'll do a deal where a seller owns a, a piece of land and, okay, we can't come to agreements on the price that I purchased that dirt from them from. Mm -hmm. So then I'll say, okay, well, you put up your land you carry that, and then I go get the construction loan, yeah. develop the deal, and yeah. then we break bread. We bust it down end, together. At Absolutely. the end of the deal, you and, know and, what I'm saying? In order to do that, so for you to go get the loan, you have to show that you own the land, right? So, so they, they quit claim date. They quit yeah. claim date. They put you on yeah. title. Yeah. Done and done. So Absolutely. it's creative, creative. in this creative. Sense. You know what I, I'm saying? I'm very familiar with that creative yeah. play in the, on the new construction. Line. So, all right, let's talk. All right, so boom. You done learned. It's crazy, bro, and I, I hope y'all following this because the skills that you kind of already had coming up is the reason why you, why you at where you at today. Because yeah. what I'm hearing is, okay, I come from Nigeria. Education is super important. Yeah. First, it started off with, okay, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get this school education. Yep. That landed you a six-figure job. Then you get this book. You read that book. Then you start learning real estate. Mm -hmm. Then you buy some properties, and then you start learning wholesaling. Mm -hmm. Then you do some wholesale deals. Then you start learning lease options. <laughs> create a so finance. at this, yeah, create a finance. So at this point, you got long term rental skills. Yeah. You got wholesaling skills, finding good deals. You got create a finance skills. So now you just sharp. What's that 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 saying like Albert Einstein, Abraham Lincoln? Um, if if I'm given an axe to cut down a tree, mm -hmm. I'm gonna sharpen it for before you. If I got six hours to do it, I'm gonna sharpen it for five hours. Mm -hmm. So. You were still making money at the same time, but what I'm seeing is because now you're in your bag, man. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I see everything that you was doing or uh, and still are doing up until now mm -hmm. is preparing you for these big plays that we about to talk about. <laughs> so boom, now you doing Airbnb. Yes, you the you the short term rental guy. You know what yes, I'm saying? Sir. Like at the end of the day, if you in Texas and you ain't heard about TJ yeah. doing these boutique hotels and these Airbnbs, like. It, you ain't trying to acquire no info. Like, I don't know what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? So, all right, talk to me about that, bro. Like, what got you just immersed in the Airbnb world? Man, I— Because uh, it seemed like you value cash flow from yeah, the start of your yeah, real estate I career. Did. I want passive income. Absolutely. June 1st, 2017, I was laid off from that engineering job. Okay. Um, I was a lead engineer working on an ExxonMobil project in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. And once that project was wrapped up, they uh, hung around for a little bit. They, there was no other job for me because the price of oil was so high. Yeah. And when the price of oil goes high, the major operators like Exxon and BP Shell, they stopped drilling. Yeah. Um, because if it costs them $46 a barrel to drill, but it, but, but the price is over $100 a barrel to, to like, so they're they just not going to drill. So when they don't drill, our company was a service company. So, so we didn't have any work. Yeah. <laughs> so they had to let me go. Yeah. And so um, I was let go that day. Normal day. Didn't know I was going to be let go. <laughs> I just went into the office, got the tap on the shoulder. Go. It's right. like the NFL, it's like huh? <laughs> it's, like, it's like hard knocks. It's like hard. <laughs> Come to the back room. Come to the back room with me. Man. Hey, uh, sure. <laughs> I appreciate all your work for the last five years, but I yep. got to let you go. Bro, and, 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 and what's crazy is that um, the guy who actually hired me, who didn't even work in my department, he was the one who came down and laid me off. He was like, man, I, I wanted to be the one to come do because I wish I didn't have to, bro. Like, yeah. cause just out of the respect. And so and that's, that's respectable. Though. That's respectable. I can respect that. A year later, um, uh, two years later, 2019, they actually, um, actually want to like, Hey, you could come back. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to come back. <laughs> you say, you don't realize y'all just blessed me. Y'all just blessed me with the land me off. Y'all just get real. My very first Airbnb was one I own. So I know that a lot of people know me and know that I do arbitrage and know mm -hmm. that I own my properties as well. But my very first one, I owned it. And there was a property that I was going to make it a regular rental, just like I did my other properties. I was fixing it up. And then I saw a video on YouTube about making money on Airbnb, how you can make three, five times more cash flow on Airbnb than regular rentals. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. So mm -hmm. let me try this play on one this, of your properties. One of the properties. So I, you still own the two properties. Oh yeah. I still, I had, I had, I still own all my properties at the time. Okay. Absolutely. And so what I did was I, I was like, all right, let me run this play. I spent an extra 14000 to furnish the, this. Furnish it. To furnish a three-bedroom, two-bath house. Okay. And uh, I listed it. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I designed it myself, I, uh, which it, it was pretty good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, I launched it mm -hmm. even with the cell phone photo. I haven't even taken professional photos yet. I was so angry. I just launched it with the mm -hmm. cell phone photo. I'm just going to see what kind of what's going to happen. And so I went home and I started watching a movie. 
from my phone. I'm like, I'm just checking that butt. <laughs> Nothing's mm. happening. And I get an inquiry. They're like, oh, I got questions. Mm. I'm like, yeah, book it. It's ready. It's nice. And nobody booked it that day. The next day, I woke up to two confirmed reservations the next mm. day when I woke up. And the price that I priced it at was even lower than market. So I said, even if I was 50% booked, I'm still looking to 2X. What I, I'm still looking at about 1,000 net mm. a month. So I'm like, damn. Okay, so let me go ahead and I went all in into short term rentals right then and there. Mm. That was a light bulb moment for me to go all in into short term rentals. But then I learned that you didn't have to own it, that you can arbitrage. You can just rent. These okay, companies. yeah, I was going to actually. Then I was what's like, that right, arbitrage? Man, the very next one, I arbitrage. Okay. The very next one. Arbitrage were essentially the middleman. I'm talking about middleman. Middleman thing, wholesaler. <laughs> thing, wholesaler. <laughs> wholesaler. <laughs> wholesaler. <laughs> Holter, Airbnb, yeah. you can be middleman. It's always like a sandwich it's lease. Like, down there. <laughs> down there. <laughs> down there. <laughs> and on sandwich lease, you're the middleman. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No key, all, even on Simon lease, you're the middleman. So, yeah. So uh, I, I, I learned that, okay, arbitrage. The bank's the middleman when you the think about it. When you think about it. They going to get money. They really going to print money and then lend. No, actually, they get you to deposit your money yep. and then go lend it out yep. and get a payment for it. Yep. That's an arbitrage play right there. That'll, bro, they, they, they're arbitrage in so many different ways. <laughs> Them lending you money is an arbitrage play. In, in, in bro, a I say this all the time, <laughs> bro. Like, it was a light switch moment for me, bro. When I see this Grant Cardone video. And you know Grant, he don't care what he said. Yeah. Grant was on the internet one day and he was talking about racism. And he was like, bro, I swear to God, black people, y'all will forget racism when you find out what the bank's doing with your money. And I said, bro, for him to say some wild stuff like this on the internet, he got to be like, like telling some truth. <laughs> he tapped in, You know what I'm bro. saying? And that made me start kind of researching, not even kind of. I started, wow. like, what is a bank? What do they do? What is the reason for this? Mm -hmm. And I'm like... I'm, and I'm going to give you an example as to how 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 crucial, how nasty these banks are. But I I, I want to stay on topic, though. Yeah. But yeah, go ahead. Oh, um, I saw this Alex Hamazi story, and he was like, gift card. This this was one. Uh, this, and I'm going to let you go back because I'm kind of getting off. But, bro, I never knew, understood gift cards. He was like, bro, do you realize that gift cards is some of the best products for businesses? Because, all right, my girl, for in, in, instances. I get her a hundred dollar gift card to Starbucks mm -hmm. all the time. She'll have like five hundred dollars in gift cards. They are using that money. It's like a loan. They using that money, yeah. go and make money yeah. before you spend before it. Before you even spend it. It don't cost them that much to make the coffee. Like when you go use the the gift card and, and and get a coffee, it don't cost them that much. So if they raise it, say they do Starbucks was the example. They do a billion dollars in gift card sales. That's basically a billion dollars of free money mm -hmm. that they could go put into something and get a return on that money. That's not their money. That's not even their money. And could you imagine how many people, what percentage people don't even just forget their gift cards, forget they yes. exist, don't even spend it? And they just using that money <laughs> over and over and just capitalizing, making money off that money, making money. Then you go finally use the gift card. They done made 10 times the money mm. that was put on that gift card. But my eyes got wide open about banks because I started doing creative financing. That's when my eyes kind of got wide open with banks. I'm going to give you an example. If I was to buy a house for half a mil, say $500,000 house, and if I was to go to a traditional bank and I want to get a loan on that property, if I get a loan at, let's go 6%, 6% loan on that property, my payments will be right under three k, about $2,997, right under $3,000 a month. 30-year note. If I went back, if I went to that same seller and I said, Mr. or Mrs. Seller, I'm going to give you $100,000 more than you're asking for your property. I'm going to give you $600,000 for your property. But you, but I want to, uh, you be the bank and I'll, I'm going to give you payments of $2,500 a month with no interest. Principal only payments of $2,500 a month. Now, guess what happens? Did you know that the $600,000 house gets paid off 10 years sooner, you're paying less every month. You're saving about $500 a month. That's that right there. Then the house is going to be paid off 10 years sooner. You paid off in 10 years and you overpaid by a whole hundred K. Versus if you went with the bank, that $500,000 house, by the end of that long term, you've paid about 1.2 million. Maybe for the same three. house, for the same house, for the whole house. And how much interest did we pay to the to to the to the bank for the if we pay six hundred thousand? If we pay if we paid the seller six hundred thousand at principal only payments, how much interest went to the bank? Zero. Zero. Nothing. 
versus the bank make versus you paying 1.2, 1.3 for the house, leveraging the bank, and I gave the seller a whole hundred K more. Damn. A whole hundred K more. So the bank, the hey, bank, bro, shit crazy, bro. <laughs> bro, that's the banks. Crazy. Are the, that's why I say the banks are the winners. The banks are the, the banks. The lenders are always the, lenders. the winners. <laughs> I'll be seeing it on some of my deals. I'm like, Damn, we leverage them. Yes, you ain't doing nothing. We win. We leverage them. We yeah. do our deals, but they are the winners. Shout out AJ. to my lenders, bro. You probably watching this. Shout out to you. Shout out to you. you shout out to them, bro. And the game is sold separately, man. If y'all you want know? to, feel free to do the math on that too. By the way, feel free to do the math. That house gets paid off. You pay hundred k more for that house, and, it, and you pay it off a whole ten years sooner. Yeah. So what if boom, you what? you say you was in arbitrage? Yep. Okay. 2017 or 2018? I started, I lost my, I did uh, my first short-term rental. I launched uh, December 2017. I did my first arbitrage January 2018. Okay, boom. So right now, where we at with it? You know, now, is it now, more arbitrage or is it more ownership or is it creative? Is it everything? So there was a point in time in my journey, when I, my short-term rental journey to where I arbitrage about 80% of my portfolio and own yeah. about 20%. But that started changing. As I started owning more properties, started buying a duplex here, uh, another duplex here. Now, then it became about 50-50. Then we started doing boutique hotels. Now we're at about 80-20 okay. <laughs> on the ownership side and arbitrage on twenty or on the 20%. What's the reason that you you valued ownership more than arbitrage? Outside of outside of the, the wealth component, um, outside of the fact that I control it. Now, when you arbitrage, don't get it twisted. You control that asset for the time of the lease term, but you don't own it. I've mm -hmm. had plenty of arbitrage uh, landlords. Man, I need my house back. They probably need to move back in or they plan on selling it, whatever the case may be. You can't do nothing about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And also the fact that I can make the additional cash flow with short-term rentals, but still be paying down that property mm -hmm. right, that I own. So building that equity piece. So the ownership and and another piece is you'll make more money if you own it, especially if you buy it right. Here's and my my thing with real estate, I don't care if you exit with an Airbnb, I don't care if you flip it, I don't care if you you make your money when you buy. Right, mm -hmm. and so if you buy it right, you'll definitely make more money owning mm -hmm. it than arbitrage it. Because even even just by logic, when you think about it, when you arbitrage, you're renting it from a landlord who has a mortgage that you're paying overs that he's cash on from. Mm -hmm. Right, so you'll make more money when you own it in theory. In theory, mm -hmm. so that's why um, I love I, I value the ownership a lot more. And I was owning real estate way before I started doing arbitrage. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that foundation was already even so ingrained that I would. I, I don't know if I would ever have valued arbitrage over ownership, even though we love arbitrage. We do it. It's, there's still money to be made there. Even today, 2024, yes, you can still be successful doing arbitrage, but you still have to be very careful for one. Make sure your leases are good. Got to protect yourself with, the, with these leases and make sure you negotiate these numbers. Mm -hmm. It's still a numbers game. Do your research, make sure to um, look into the cash flow, the expected cash flow, and look into it before before you get into these leases, because some what's, people do get burnt. What's some of your like favorite sites or tools or resources that you use like whenever you analyzing a property to arbitrage Airbnb? Like how do you find out what you could get? Yeah. You know, in that Honestly, area, there's softwares. Was. Yeah, there are softwares that'll help you. Um there's, you know, AirDNA, most people know about that. Okay. Uh, you can check out AirDNA. It's almost like it's like the MLS for a short term rental world. You know, mm -hmm. you can run comps on there, look at what other listings are performing, what their performance has been over the past, you know, months or or, or year or whatever the case may be. I mean, I would take the data that data from AirDNA and any of these sites like Mash Visor is another one. Nash Mash Mash Visor, okay. STR Insights is another one. Uh, okay. So I would take I would take the, the data from AirDNA and these sites with a grain of salt, though, because, you know, it's really hard for them to track. For example, if a property is uh, performing as a short term rental, they'll show you like what, what it's made, made for the year. But it's really hard to know if that property is a full time Airbnb or is it just a part time Airbnb? Mm -hmm. Is the person, do they just do it every other month because they're out of town? So when you see those numbers, you don't know if it's actually like the true numbers or not. So you, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's good. Use it. Use it. Just kind of take uh, take with a grain of salt. So what I do is I do my own research, bro. Mm -hmm. You go into listings yourself, look at com do comparable analysis. Use sites like Rank Breeze to see what the top performing listings are in the area to see what they're Rank doing. Breeze? Rank Breeze, yeah. Okay. See what the top listings are in the area and see what they're doing to see how you can make sure you level up and have those amenities and see if you can get those amenities in your listing as well. I do a lot of self research, and I encourage people to do a lot of self research to find out if that deal makes sense before even getting into it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now nah, that makes sense. So, you know, during the, you, you probably know I was going to ask you this, during COVID, Airbnb shut down, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of people, they lost their yeah. properties uh, because they were buying them at elevated prices mm -hmm. just because 
you know, the Airbnb cash flow. So like, do you, when you underwriting a property for Airbnb and you might get a mortgage or a loan on it, are you paying attention to the long-term rental also in case, you know, something happens with the Airbnb side of things? If you, if you, even if you go back to any, any of the content that I've posted okay. when I first started doing Airbnb, because okay. that's one of the mistakes I started seeing people doing. And this was before COVID. This is bef- this was before COVID. Yeah. This is before COVID. People will buy, um, people will buy Airbnbs and I'll be like, man, okay, you buy, put 20% out. Okay. Uh, will it make money with a regular tenant? My rule of thumb when it comes to these Airbnbs, do not buy it just based off of Airbnb's numbers. The property has to make sense with a regular tenant. It mm-hmm. has to. Because, again, you can never know what could happen. You may need a pivot. And, again, you you make your money when you buy. you got to buy it right. Mm-hmm. If it only makes sense if that it makes money with Airbnb, then you didn't buy it right. Man, so many things that happen in this Airbnb world, bro. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you even—we ain't even talk about ordinances. Mm-hmm. Right, ordinances. They that's why I was the zoning, you know, like, like the zoning the ish, laws and all that. I mean, there's a lot of cities that are getting hit now. Now, Nashville then got tore up with that, bro. Nashville too got, got tore up with that, right? Yeah, they're probably about to shut it all down in New Orleans. The whole thing. Yeah, bro, they the shut it down. They did the it in New York already. In New York, um, you heard about Dallas as well. Yo. Um, so now, tons of market with opportunity. Like mm-hmm. we're talking, we're lifting our markets right now that that we're with the restrictions, but. Lots of opportunity out there. Tons of markets are cool with it. Like it's not. So you still tell people like STR short term rental is still the play. Absolutely, you just got a great play. Yo, the way know. that is being done, you got to know exactly what you're doing. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's see when I got into it back in 2017, I probably could, probably could have picked up a couch off the street and made money on Airbnb because mm-hmm. the expectations were so low because mm-hmm. it was still so new. It was new. Think about it now. Airbnb is public for one. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. a public trailer company now. Um, Airbnb is a lot more known post COVID. Mm-hmm. So as time change also means expectations have also changed. Mm-hmm. And so people expect more and expect a lot more out of their listings on Airbnb. Versus a hotel. Versus, versus, versus well, like hotels that found a way to become better than Airbnbs in a sense. Here's, here's you know, and you bring about a good point. And this, this is my thing with other short-term rental hosts and people that even want to get into this business. Understand that um, the biggest issue plaguing this business is not Airbnb slowing down or... Stuff we're talking about, Mark, you know, that, that viral post about, oh, it's down 46% in this market, in this market. It's act- What's crazy is Airbnb actually did very well as a company last year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like they did very, it's the, if, if it's the increased supply mm. that's taken. So what happens is, is that because of the increased supply, um, even though, even if Airbnb does good, there's still more people sharing in that revenue, right? Mm-hmm. And so the thing is, is that now there's still, Money, that means that there's still plenty of money coming into the space. It's just being diverted to the people that actually deserve it. Mm-hmm. That's why when you want to get into this business, look, try to be in top 15% of your market. Mm-hmm. Because what's happening right now is just like what happens in most businesses to where the top 15, top 20% is getting most of the bookings. The winners win. And the, and the bottom, is they're literally scrambling for the bottom 50% of reservations. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so the winners, and so it's still a great, great, great business to be in. Great time to be in it. If you're going to be someone that prioritizes the amenities, prioritizes the guest experience, prioritize not just providing a stay, but provide an experience is with, with with it as well. Those are the people that's that that's winning right now in the short term. Okay. Run. Well, I got a few questions before I oh. get you out of here, bro. I want to, to talk to you real quick because this is the biggest problem with Airbnb right now. And it's not the market slowing down. This mm-hmm. is right. Yeah. Okay. Increased supply, less opportunity. There's still money to be made if you know what you're doing. The biggest issue, and, and, and you mentioned hotels, hotels will always have Airbnb beat on one thing consistency. Consistency. If I book a Hampton Inn right here in Nashville and I go book one in Houston, guess what? It's the same thing. Mm-hmm. It's the same eggs for breakfast, down to the bagel, same mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. And most people would rather a consistent seven than a two two out of ten experience here, five out of ten here, eight out of ten here. Maybe they have a good experience with this host. They book another bad experience with this host. Bad. So the inconsistency in the short term rental world is messing us up because when we lose somebody based off bad experience, we just lost them to a hotel. Yeah, and most likely we're not getting them back into the Airbnb world. This is the biggest problem with Airbnb right now. Yeah, it's not necessarily. Booking Bro, I agree because, like, because like I, me, myself, I, I book hotels before Airbnbs mm-hmm. most of the time. You know what I'm saying? Now, if it's a larger party, mm-hmm. Airbnbs always kind of win. You like if it like 
I think once you start staying somewhere like over five days a week, mm -hmm. you know, and if you have like a large party, then Airbnb is like the way to go. But the things I think about with Airbnb is like, you could have this nice, you don't know if you about to be in the hood somewhere. Cause I didn't book it. <laughs> and it, I ain't, I'm not going to say I got a problem with it, mean. but like you will book a nice ass Airbnb <laughs> and be in the middle of the trenches. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so now I'm like, damn, I'm trying to make sure I'm straight. You know what I'm saying? Everything. <laughs> then it's like, you will book an Airbnb. They only got two towels in there or something mm -hmm. like that. You know, just mm -hmm. and, and that it's that inconsistency because it's all these independent contractors, independent owners of these units. Yes. And every Airbnb owner it's is different. not measured the same. Not. But guess what? Hotels, <laughs> they go through so many reg like at the end of the day, that they thing, are consistent. It bro. has to be consistent. It has to be consistent. It has to be. Just per the brand, it has to be consistent. Yeah. Bro. Yeah, so, so you, I see that. Uh, I, I got to talk about this before I get you out here. So, mm -hmm. bro, you you got into the boutique hotel yes, space. Mm -hmm. So just like one, how you even do that? Because yeah. like I ain't never met. Let me think. Yeah, I, I think you probably the first black man I met that <laughs> that's walking around talking about buying hotels and owning hotels. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. like, how you even get into that and how you liking it? You know, man. since you you know done it. So the, what, what opened my mind up to boutique hotels was when I bought a duplex, my mm -hmm. very first duplex as an Airbnb. I that duplex, I started renting it out, um, and I realized a few things just from the just from two units. Mm -hmm. um, I realized that man, operations is a little different, mm -hmm. easier. Um, I can actually make more money because I was offering the whole building. For mm -hmm. a large party, you can book each individual unit, or you could book the whole building. And I would charge like, say, for example, if each unit would rent for one twenty, I would charge like five hundred for the whole building per night, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and and those those people were loving that, right? Mm -hmm. So I was like, man, and I, and I love the fact that um, I love the fact of, of course, the increased income, all that stuff. And then I said, man, multiple units in one location is pretty attractive. I want more multiple units in one location, and that's. While my mind opened up to looking into boutique hotels. And so the very first one I did, though, wasn't an actual boutique hotel I purchased. was an apartment complex that I purchased. I converted it over to a boutique hotel. Okay. And when you look did at— you have you, to rezone it to do uh, that? In that particular area, no. Okay. But in, in a lot of situations, you may, you will have to. You might mm -hmm. have to. But in that particular situation, I didn't. Um, I, when you think about it, it's different. Boutique hotels has pr some pretty serious differences from Airbnb from the way you operate it. Operations is totally different. I want you to do because operations is a lot easier. We can we everything could be a lot more centralized. Um, but when you look at the fact that you don't necessarily have to run into zoning issues because now you had you don't just have an Airbnb, you have a business. Mm -hmm. This is commercial now, so you know you're not necessarily succumb to those to those issues as well. So so those are multiple reasons why boutique hotels became a lot more attractive outside of the additional income, the additional cash flow. Um, so it's it's that's why boutique hotels became a lot more attractive for me. And so now we're not only looking at boutique hotels. But we're also now looking at some branded branded hotels as well. Okay, got you. So, how many units in that that one that you did the uh, uh, boutique? The first one, the yeah. one I uh, thirteen. Yeah, uh, 13. 13, thirteen units. 13. So, are they are they Airbnbs? Are they? Do you all, have your own, own hosting yeah, platform. There, there, there's our own website, and that's the thing. See, when you get into boutique hotels, understand you. I mean, okay, if you just have a bunch of units on Airbnb, and that's it, you're not necessarily a boutique. You plan yourself. You just. Huh? You're just doing Airbnb with a bunch of your units, which is cool. But if you're trying to be in the boutique hotel space, you got to understand you have a business now. Mm -hmm. This is not just Airbnb. Now you got to build a brand around this business. You got to mm -hmm. have your website. People got to be able to book directly to you. Are you are you focused on building B2C? Do you have marketing strategies to where people can come back and book with you directly? Do you have strategies to where you, you are, have B2B relationships where you can reach out to uh, businesses and hospitals to get you, you let the way they know your building's there. They can get you booked. So now you have an actual business. I mean, this is it's, it's, it's different from just doing mm -hmm. Airbnb for sure. Because now, like you said, like the big thing that I see is like with Airbnb is that Airbnb is that's their platform. So yeah. they're collecting all the information yeah. and they're marketing to the customer base there. But, you know, uh, I see people that are the, the most p successful like Airbnb or short term rental or whatever you want to call it, like investors are the ones that started building a platform outside, outside. of Airbnb yeah, yeah, yeah. to where now they could communicate with their client base outside of them. And that might be through email marketing. That might be, you know, B2B, you know what I'm saying? Doing affiliate, you know, referral marketing and all of that because now, okay, my business doesn't solely depend on Airbnb. That's just a stream, you know, because 
people call it all Airbnb, but technically it's short term rentals. And you got like Airbnb, you got VRBO, you got shit, Booking.com. Booking, TripAdvisor, Expedia. Yeah. <laughs> you have Expedia. Yeah, you got all these different platforms that is basically they're marketing to the customers to book. Basically, they middleman it. They, <laughs> they middleman it. <laughs> they middle they man. getting the clients. You putting your property on their platform and they charging you a fee. That's, that's the definition of a middleman. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so now you build your own platform yeah. and maybe someday you could be a middleman because maybe you could say, hey, I got this platform of people that book with me in Houston. Mm -hmm. Now you might could find somebody in Atlanta that got a boutique Airbnb and say, hey, let's work out a deal and you put your boutique Airbnb on my platform. Mm -hmm. Now at this point you mixing brands so you probably want to vet them and make sure that they got a good experience but now okay I start sending people your way and you cut me I don't know 20% 30% mm -hmm. because I'm sending the clientele your way mm -hmm. you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying so I think it's extremely important to build your own platform whenever you have STRs or Airbnbs whatever the, you want to the call number it. one thing in order to along that to your point and you, know, you want to build your own platform and start building your own brand um one thing that we have to start doing as STR operators is look at the way, change the way we look at Airbnb. Okay. We have to change it. So Airbnb, we have to look at it not just an income as an income source. Yes, we make money from it. Yes, we, we, we get bookings from it. But we also have to look at it as a lead source. What I mean by that is you can leverage Airbnb to build your own database. Mm -hmm. and, and every single person, not just the person that books, but every single person that steps foot in your property, you should have their data. You mm -hmm. should absolutely should have their data, um, and that's just selling that's products at that point. Oh man, you collect you collect data, and now now what can we do with that data? We can retarget them. Mm -hmm. You can market to them right via text, via email to get them to book back with us directly or get us referral business. Mm -hmm. it, if you can have a consistent, automated mm -hmm. way to collect information and have marketing going out to your to your guests because they're your guests, they're your database, then this is one of the one of the more important ways to start building your own uh, brand for sure in the short term. Yeah. Record. And hotels understand that, bro. Like, oh, yeah. Especially in Vegas. <laughs> hotels understand. You go gamble one time in Vegas, <laughs> they emailing you and texting you. You, you can't even get into the Wi Fi yeah. without get, putting your information in there to get into the Wi Fi. So, and that's one of that's the main way. That's what, the main way we in our business gets every single person's in our building is through the Wi Fi. Mm. We get it through the. He wi just dropped the nugget on you, <laughs> right there through the Wi-Fi, right indirect. Through. No reason why you couldn't do it in your own Airbnb. Yep. No reason why you can't. Man, bro. Well, look, TJ, bro. I really appreciate you coming Man, on here, bro. You really fun. dropped a lot of game, like just you know the build up of your story. You know, coming from Africa, you say you was walking to school. Like I was in Jamaica a few months ago, and I <laughs> I see you know they yeah. got all the uniforms yeah. on and walking Backpack, to school. Tight. You know, and uh, yeah, it's a tight knit family, but. You know, that change from coming um, from Nigeria to America is a big difference. You know what I'm saying? And, like, what I see is that it don't matter what it is, I'm going to push through it. You know what I'm saying? That's kind of the mindset that I'm seeing right now, uh, like, just throughout what you've been explaining to me. Absolutely. So um, how can the people, like, just stay in touch with you, uh, tap man, in with you, bro? Tap on me, social media, of course, um, at TJ Tajani, really, on okay. all platforms. Um, TikTok is Mr. TJ to Johnny. Mm -hmm. And uh, but yeah, definitely tap in with TJ T I J A N I. Hey, that's all. That's a wrap, man, bro. Hey, y'all heard what I said at the beginning. I'm gonna say it again. Make sure you you are taking action on the things that you are learning in this show every single week. Make sure you like, subscribe, share, comment, share with some friends. Let them know, hey, TJ, bro, just gave a game on how I can get some Airbnbs, <laughs> how I can middleman these deals and make money using other people's assets or other people's resources. And then once I make that money, I can start buying and owning my own resources with it, okay? So y'all make sure y'all tune in. Every single week we drop in Monday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. And that's a wrap. We out.